This is Dan Syed from International Medcom and part of RDTN. And uh, he's here, he's going to be talking about uh, Geiger counter calibration and uh, measurement techniques. So I guess if you could start off maybe with a uh, calibration, like how would you calibrate a Geiger counter? Oh, why, why would you calibrate a Geiger counter? Okay, well the reason to calibrate an instrument is essentially you're wanting to ensure that the quality of your data is accurate and you know, representative of the true situation. Uh, to do that, there's a number of ANSI standards in America that apply to radiation detectors as they are used in different circumstances. It's different for use in certain types of medicine versus industrial safety, um, things like that. But the basic uh, premise behind it is to ensure quality and so that you're able to adequately protect public health. The, uh, the way that a, a radiation calibration is typically done is from a distance from the source. Because if you have the, the radiation coming out from the source, if you're at some distance from it, you, you have kind of a uniform field. And the closer that you are to the source, the more likely that you're going to have inaccuracies because the inverse square law dictates that when you double the distance, the radiation level drops to a quarter. So if you have a, up here, if you're like a half an inch from the source, if you go to one inch, it drops to a quarter. And so little tiny differences in the positioning can play a significant role in, in not being accurate. So um, typically you'll have a, a high level source with a robotic arm that will move it around and the calibrations typically cost between $50 and $100 mm -hmm. and they're typically done annually and they're also typically done at two-thirds of full scale. Uh -huh. So if you have an instrument that has 100 MR per hour full scale, you would do it at you know, 66 MR per hour or somewhere in that region. So. Uh what if you had like a digital instrument where you didn't have full scale? Well, they do have full scale. They have a specified full scale. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, yeah. so ours go as a little, our instruments go a little bit above 100 mR per hour, or oh, okay. the equivalent in Sieverts, but it's huh. it's still um, specified to be oh, okay. 100. So you do it at like 66. So, so is, oh. because. So what, you know, when we're talking about probes for this project, these instruments can be sent out to be calibrated by this method. Mm -hmm. And they can be done like that once a year. Or you can do a quality assurance check on the probe, on the detector itself, and you can do an electronic calibration to, uh, through the side jack on the instrument to ensure the electronics are all solid. My, my, my experience with Geiger counters, having designed them for 33 years, is that they're very stable these days. In the old days, you know, where you had analog electronics and Geiger tubes that weren't as good quality, you could get drift. And, but we find that usually, you know, 99% of the time, the instrument's going to be working perfectly 10 years from now. So, but it's, you want to do a quality assurance step, to ensure that it is, you know, giving quality data and also to assure the public and any agencies that might be watching you that you have a program that gives, lends credibility to the program. How would you do like a QA check, like a simple QA so check? So QA check is typically done with a, a check source, which is what that Cobalt 60 source is that I brought to you. Hmm. Uh, typically, though, in the industry, cesium-137 is used hmm. because it's kind of a mid-range energy gamma. It's actually not, the gamma is actually not from cesium-137 though, it's from the metastable barium daughter. Uh, cesium-137 is primarily beta. Uh, whereas cobalt is uh, gamma? Cobalt-60 is more gamma, yeah. So if we had uh, check sources, like say in the hackerspace, and then people could come in and uh, and do like a, I guess a QA check, that would be a well, decent. A QA check, you know, it, I'd say you want to work with the smallest sources you can. So mm -hmm. one micro is uh -huh. kind of typical, 
And you can do it at contact, mm. or you could do 10 microcuries and do it at 6 inches. Oh. 10 microcuries is getting a little hot, though, so yeah. I would handle the sources with, you know, tongs, you know, like barbecue tongs, something oh. like that, so you're putting them right on your hand. So me grabbing that check source and putting it on my Geiger counter will Geiger I don't tube do it all the time. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, then, you know, when you're handling the um, Fiesta Ware or the Thorium, you know, you, uh -huh. you want to keep them in plastic bags and mm -hmm. wash your hands afterwards so nothing flakes off. Uh, you know, handle them with respect. Uh, yeah. I'm going to go wash my hands your right fingers afterwards, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, so, uh, for, oh, so for the check sources, so you recommend either Cobalt 60 or Cesium 137? I, I recommend Cesium 137 because it is a beta emitter and because it's also um, kind of the industry standard. Hmm. Yeah. So, um, so typically you, you could you could take the uh, cesium-137 source, one microcurry, I can help you find that if you have any trouble, and maybe just uh, uh, glue it onto the end of a stick, like a, you know, or a ruler, take uh -huh. a ruler, uh -huh. and uh, double sticky tape it, and, uh -huh. and then you can hold it up to the instrument to run your calibration check. Okay. And then you can just have a safe place you put it where it's, mm. I, I like to use these little, um, uh, safes, uh, are, you know, just like the ones that you can uh, put documents the, in. The firebox, the security firebox, box. Yeah, uh, just keep it in there. Okay. And then put that in the garage somewhere. You know, okay. In the corner. <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, so that's kind of basically, I, you know, if you have a sticker, you know, a, a, a calibration procedure mm. that you say we're going to do this every three months or every six months, and we're going to log the data, and we're going to. We're going to account for the, um, there's formulas that you can Google for accounting for the half-life because the cesium, one microcurie of cesium is going to be, you know, half a microcurie of cesium in 30 years. And in between, there'll be a little bit of uh, drop off. Drop off, yeah. Um, it might be worth investing in the 1% calibrated that sources. They're more expensive. The, yeah. But... Those are like roughly two hundred and fifty dollars or something. It's not yeah. too bad. And then, but, uh, so you want to you want to establish a range that you might expect from instrument to instrument at contact, mm -hmm. and um, I think we're going to have to drive that a little bit empirically. It's going to be easier if you're like six inches from a ten microcurry source than at contact with one microcurry. Mm -hmm. You're going to get some variation. 